Tonight in Joshua chapter 13, we enter the next, I guess, major division in the book of Joshua. So far we had Israel entering the land in chapters 1 through 4, taking the land in chapters 5 through 12, and beginning tonight with Israel possessing the land, which will cover chapters 13 through 21. Now again, if you know the book of Joshua well, or if you've read ahead, you're probably thinking this is not the fun part of Joshua. You know, when you're um, watching war movies, is a lot more fun than attending a land survey, right? There are a lot of dry riverbeds and crumbling wall accounts in this section. Battle strategies and crumbling wall, or uh, battle strategies and dramatic battles are a lot more interesting than plotting over land and counting villages and tracing borders. That's very normal to feel when you read this text or these texts because these allotments don't have anything to do with us, right? We're completely detached from these things, even as Christians reading the Bible today. You and I are not promised land inheritances and allotments, and we have the better portion. Make no mistake, land decays, but imagine being alive at that time, hearing the land distribution as an old covenant Israelite would have heard it. One of my preferred commentators on the book of Joshua has been Dale Ralph Davis. I really like him. and He shared a story here about the old wooden desk chair that he uses in his study. He says the material disintegrated a long time ago and was replaced by a, a solid piece of masonite that was screwed into the frame of the seat. A chunk of old board has been added beneath the seat for support. Some additional wire has been installed where necessary. He says that if you were to run your hands across this chair or sit in this chair, it's pretty easy to get a splinter. And he says that if, if his study became your study, and he left all of that there, one of the first things you would probably do is get rid of that chair for a better one. Why? Because that chair means nothing to you. Why does he use it? Because it does mean something to him. It was his father's office chair, repaired by his father in his father's own unique way, and he gave it to his son as a gift. In a sense, it's part of his inheritance, Dale Ralph Davis's. If, if you looked at that chair like he looked at it, it might change your view of it. And that's what we have to try to do with Joshua 13 to 21 if we can. We might find these lists incredibly dull, but this describes an Israelite's promised inheritance, and there's nothing dull about that. This is a promise kept. Again, line for line. To your seed I will give this land, in Genesis 12, 7. An Israelite had that text in the mind or read that text and said, "That's I'm the seed that actually receives that promised land. Abraham's grandchildren, of course, generations removed, but still his grandchildren in a sense, could walk into the wadis and count the towns all throughout Canaan that formed the particulars of God's promise. So it will be for us, beloved, but on a scale much more grand, in a covenant that is fulfilled and held secure and kept forever by Jesus Christ. We will most assuredly receive the inheritance promised to us in Christ in the new heavens and the new earth. Let me pray and we'll look at this chapter. Our Father, thank you for all that is ours by virtue and for the sake of Christ and Christ alone. Thank you, God, that we will reap what he has sown. Lord, give us ears to hear this passage tonight as it would have been heard by these Israelites. God, give us the ability to understand its meaning, how it is profitable today even for us, Father, but may we understand what we are learning about your promises and your Son in these things. Help me to speak, Father, and preach to that end and no other, and help us all to believe what you have said in the gospel. We ask and pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So real quickly here before I read, there are two main sections in Joshua 13. Okay, verses 1 through 7 introduce the whole section, chapters 13 through 21, that is. 
verses 8 through 33 detail the territory that the two and a half Transjordan tribes, Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh, had already been allotted by Moses. So that's where we are tonight. We'll try to look at the chapter, though, as a whole. I'll pick it up in verse 1 here <coughs> of 13. Now Joshua was old and advanced in years. And the Lord said to him, You are old and advanced in years. And there remains yet very much land to possess. This is the land that yet remains, all the regions of the Philistines and all those of the Jeshurites, from the Shihor, which is east of Egypt, northward to the boundary of Ekron. It is counted as Canaanite. There are five rulers of the Philistines, those of Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron, and those of the Avim. In the south, all the land of the Canaanites in the era that belongs to the Sidonians, to Aphek, to the boundary of the Amorites, and the land of the Gebelites and all Lebanon toward the sunrise, from Balgad below Mount Hermon to Lebo Hamath, all the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon to Misrephoth Ma'im, even all the Sidonians. I myself will drive them out from before the people of Israel. Only allot the land to Israel for an inheritance, as I have commanded you. Now therefore divide this land for an inheritance to the nine tribes and half the tribe of Manasseh. Joshua is most likely in his upper 80s or early 90s here, as the Lord speaks, probably a little older than Caleb, who we'll find out in 1410 was 85 at this point. Joshua was already an older man when the conquest began about seven years earlier now, and there's still much land left to occupy. Joshua's task now is to allot to each of the tribes their particular inheritance for them to go and finish cleaning out and occupy. While there's still much land to be conquered, don't let verse 1 make you forget how much has been accomplished, though, under Joshua's leadership. But the land that remains that the Lord is talking about consists of the Philistine corridor in the southwest of Canaan. This is verses 2 to 4, the first part of verse 4. And in the north, a piece of land about 50 miles wide in verses 4 to the first part of verse 6 with the northern edge of that portion extending inward to Lebo Hamath, which is 50 miles north of Damascus in Syria. All their modern-day Syria. All this land is technically on the edges of Israel's land, which means uh, they had conquered a significant piece of the main part of Canaan. It's not total dominance yet, but it is substantial dominance. There's a power vacuum here with these conquered peoples and the regions they were for Israel to take advantage of. So now it's time to allot the land to tribes who were supposed to follow up and extend Israel's dominance there in the second part of verse 6 and 7. And still, even now, these tribes are not being told they'll have to rely on themselves to accomplish this, that God has done what God is going to do, and now it's up to you. That's not what they hear. There, in other words, there's no reason given to them to not keep doing what they're doing. In the latter part of verse 6, it's still clear that God himself will drive them out from before the people of Israel. And if they looked at paper or at a map, that, uh, that promise would have taken great confidence to believe. They are to conquer regions far north of Sidon and as far as Lebo Hamath. But what do the Israelites know at this point in their history with God? The massive power of God that he will employ to keep the promises that he makes, even in the face of impossible odds. One commentator says, God's promises take in the scope of his will for us, not merely the limits of what we think to be likely. Note the setting of God's promises so far in Joshua. In chapter 1, God's promise about Canaan came right in the face of Moses' death. Here it comes again in light of Joshua's old age. There are certain realities God is not going to work around. Joshua is old, and he's getting older. You and I are passing away. You and I are transient. And one of the worst things we can do is think that if such and such a person dies, passes away, isn't able to speak, that God is somehow handicapped by that void that's created. This is not the case. Never has been, never will be. And Israel is probably thinking as they look at Joshua, 
late 80s, early 90s, how much more are we going to be able to really do here? He's not going to be able to go out with us and fight and lead us. And God is saying, but I'm still here. I'm still in control of these things. We are transient. We are passing away. We are decaying. There is nothing we can do to stop this. And God holds fast. God remains. God is not changing. God is not decaying. God isn't breaking faith. as We talked about the other night from Psalm 146. He doesn't change. Joshua isn't dead, like I said, but he's of an old enough age that he can't go out to battle anymore. He's about to retire, so to speak, but God will continue. He won't miss a step. He never has. He never will. Joshua is old. God is not. Not the way we think. God will drive them out. Again, our mortality, our physical limitations will never put God at a disadvantage or keep him from doing what he wants to do. We cannot think too highly of ourselves. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Pick it up in verse 8. <clears throat> With the other half of the tribe of Manasseh, the Reubenites and the Gadites received their inheritance, which Moses gave them beyond the Jordan eastward, as Moses the servant of the Lord gave them, from Aroer, which is on the edge of the valley of the Arnon, and the city that is in the middle of the valley, and all the tableland of Medeba as far as Debon, and all the cities of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, as far as the boundary of the Ammonites and Gilead, and the region of the Jeshurites and Maacathites, and all Mount Hermon, and all Bashan to Salika, all the kingdom of Og in Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth and in Edri. He alone was left of the remnant of the Rephaim. He was a giant. They're, they're, these Moses had struck and driven out, yet the people of Israel did not drive out the Jeshurites or the Maacathites. But Geser and Ma'akaf dwell in the midst of Israel to this day when this was being written. And you can almost hear the sense of foreboding in that last verse. Israel's diligence was waning. Right? We have a general description here of the boundaries of the land possessed by the tribes that settled east of the Jordan. All but the exception that's given there in verse 13. Look at that again. Yet the people of Israel did not drive out the Jeshurites or the Maacathites, but Jeshur and Maacath dwell in the midst of Israel to this day. Jeshur was northeast of the Sea of Galilee. Maacath was north of Jeshur. This is the first of several statements that we're going to read in the rest of Joshua and even into Judges 1 like this, unfortunately. This is the first of a series of waning diligence in Israel. Because we are dependent on men, because we continue to put our hope in men, when they begin to die off, when they begin to wane, when they begin to get old, we pull back with them. This is what we do. As though now it can't be like it was before. And if it can't be like it was before, it can't be any good. This is wrong thinking, beloved. They stopped short of what God had told them to do. God hadn't changed. It's not like God made his plan and forgot that Joshua was going to get old or that Moses was going to die. All this has been taken into account by our God. Neither Moses nor Joshua led in a way that would put the people at a disadvantage or, or make them dependent on them, thinking that if they weren't there, they couldn't do what God wanted them to do. That's not why God raises up human leaders so that you get dependent on them, and then if they aren't there, they die. And if they make you think that you're dependent on them, that's their issue, not God's. Reason surely got in the way, self-preservation, right? I mean, they're tired. Surely we don't need to drive out every single solitary person of the Canaanites. We don't have to, maybe we can handle that later. You know, we'll just take care of it down the road when, when we're a little more stable, when things get a little more stable, but even more sinister and tragic was the way that the religion of Canaan will begin to affect the Israelites. As they don't listen to God, they intermarry with these pagan tribes. They bring in other gods alongside God and try to worship them too, even after all that God had done for them and proven to them. It was one thing to conquer a territory. That that almost is exciting. 
It was another thing entirely to persevere over a long period of time to occupy the whole territory that was allotted to every tribe. That's not as fancy. That's not as dramatic. That's work every day. That, that something would have to be done to maintain the purity of the land. When we are responsible, here's what we learn about the human condition in texts like Joshua. When we are responsible for any of the work to secure our side of the covenant, what will come out is how unserious we actually are about our salvation. Despite all the lip service we give to doing good works and effort and discipline. When those things aren't going to get you a big prize or big recognition, or maybe they won't have a big return, we don't want to do them. We don't want to stay in it day in and day out, even when it's hard, even if it's unseen, even if it just becomes a part of the mundane pattern of everyday life. That's not what we want. We want big. We want fast. We want visible. We'll cut corners with the law here and there. We'll have to listen to everything God says. Who can do that? Listen to everything God has said for His church. We were in Brawley at Gateway, and I was in a meeting with the elders, and there was one gentleman who had sown discord to the point that it was dishonest, and we had to confront it. And we were reading down the list of qualifications for an elder and how he had broken them. And one of the other elders said, well, yeah, if we want to be dogmatic about it. What, what do you mean? If, if we want to be dogmatic about what the Word says, then yes, we would need to remove this man from eldership. What else are we supposed to be with God's Word? Just relax it because we're friends? I, it's hard. It stinks. But look, we do, that, that's what we do. When, when it's going to be hard to do what God has very clearly said to do, and there isn't, it, like it's not, it's just like we have to do this because that's what the Bible tells us to do. We don't get motivated by that. We aren't motivated to serve the Lord when serving the Lord means we might have to make a stand here and do something very difficult and there isn't going to be any big, great thing that happens from it. It's just, it's going to be hard to maintain and deal with. That's what Israel's doing here. They, they had won the great battles. They had gone through the big victories. Now it's like, we got to maintain this. We still got a little cleanup to do. Well, we, no, we, we don't. Let's, we're, we're not going to drive out everybody. We're not going to take the Lord that seriously and be that dogmatic about what He says. It brings no immediate crisis here in chapter 13. We don't see that yet, but we will, and it will. Israel will lose Canaan. Israel will never be able to gain it back. And we like to work ourselves up to deal with the great crises of our faith. But staying faithful in the mundane, right? So we, we champion, we want to champion big causes. You know, we want to drive the big sins out of our country, right? But what about the other sins that we put up with amongst one another every day that are just as, if not more damaging to the body of Christ than the big sins that the country's dealing with? Those aren't really affecting us here, at least not yet. But what about addressing the sins and the issues that God has called sin, that God has said are divisive, that God has said need to be cleaned out of His church? What about addressing those? We don't want to do those. We don't want to do that type of work for the Lord. We'll talk all day about what we want to accomplish for the Lord if it means something big, but not like the everyday hard stuff. That we don't want to do. We will falter. Staying faithful in the mundane. Long obedience in the same direction. That, that is not what we want to do. We regard that as less important. And so will falter. We don't believe we need to heed every word of the Lord. We don't trust that we're completely dependent on Him for our salvation. We'll gladly reason a way forward for ourselves on our own terms, even in light of the promise. Israel had everything they needed, and they wouldn't listen. We pick it up in verse 14. 
To the tribe of Levi alone, Moses gave no inheritance. The offerings by fire to the Lord God of Israel are their inheritance, as he said to him. And Moses gave an inheritance to the tribe of the people of Reuben according to their clans. So their territory was from Arawer, which is on the edge of the valley of the Arnon, and the city that is in the middle of the valley, and all the tableland by Medeba, with Heshbon and all its cities that are in the tableland, Dibon and Bamath Baal, and Beth Baal Miam, and Jahaz, and Kadamoth, and Mapha'ath, and Kiriathayim, and Sibma, and Jirath Shahar on the hill of the valley, and Beth Peor, and the slopes of Pisgah, and Beth Jeshimoth, that is, all the cities of the tableland, and all the kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, who Moses defeated with the leaders of Midian, Evi and Rechem and Zur and Hur and Reba, the princes of Sihon who lived in the land. Balaam also, the son of Beor, the one who practiced divination, the one whose donkey talked to him. He was killed with the sword by the people of Israel among the rest of their slain. And the border of the people of Reuben was the Jordan as a boundary. This was the inheritance of the people of Reuben according to their clans with their cities and villages. Moses gave an inheritance also to the tribe of Gad to the people of Gad according to their clans. Their territory was Jazer and all the cities of Gilead and half the land of the Ammonites to Arawer, which is east of Rabbah, and from Heshbon to Ramath Mizpah and Betonim and from Mahanaim to the territory of Debir and in the valley Beth Haram, Beth Nimrah, Succoth and Zaphon, the rest of the kingdom of Sihon, king of Heshbon, having the Jordan as a boundary to the lower end of the Sea of Chinnereth or Galilee, eastward beyond the Jordan. This is the inheritance of the people of Gad according to their clans with their cities and villages. And Moses gave an inheritance to the half-tribe of Manasseh. It was allotted to the half-tribe of the people of Manasseh according to their clans. Their region extended from Mahanaim through all Bashan, the whole kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, and all the towns of Jair, which are in Bashan, 60 cities, and half Gilead and Ashtaroth and Edri, the cities of the kingdom of Og in Bashan. These were allotted to the people of Makir, the son of Manasseh, for the half of the people of Meshkir, according to their clans. These are the inheritances that Moses distributed in the plains of Moab, beyond the Jordan, east of Jericho. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave no inheritance. That's repeated from verse 14. The Lord God of Israel is their inheritance, just as he said to them. God's word holds fast. Verses 8 through 13 give a general description of the boundaries of the Transjordan possession. What you see in the rest of that, these verses is that being parsed out in more detail. What did it look like for the tribe of Reuben in verses 15 to 23, for the tribe of Gad in verses 24 to 28, and then half of the tribe of Manasseh in 29 to 31. To give a rough sketch, relatively quickly, Reuben's territory, which was the southernmost, stretched from the Arnon River north to Heshbon, Gad's from Heshbon up to Mahanaim, nearer on the Jabbok River, with a sliver of land reaching up to the Sea of Galilee, or Chinnereth. And the one half of Manasseh's land went from Mahanaim up to and including all of Bashan. So clear as mud, right? We know exactly what that looks like. It looks like a big jumble of lakes and rivers and valleys and plains and towns. But you have to take note again of all the repeated references to Israel's victories over Sihon and Og not to mention Balaam. What is that all about? It means that throughout all this geography and topography are reminders of the victories God had given to Israel all the way back when they were under Moses. It's meant to act as a constant jogging of their memories to fortify their faith when they continued to face their enemies. You know who God defeated in the past in these places. Clean them out. It's yours. Take it. I'll be with you. I'll drive them out before you. When they remember how God defeated Sihon and Og, the last of the Rephaim, of the giants, the Nephilim, they'll remember that God had compassion on them. He helped them. He will continue to. He's powerful. We learn a valuable lesson here about living by faith. Faith is energized in us to remain steadfast by remembering what God has already accomplished for us. We've talked about this a couple times as we've gone through Joshua. You and I don't need new stuff. right? We don't need a new word. We need to remember the old word. But at the end of the passage, the writer actually points Israel 
and the people of God who read the scriptures today to the true inheritance in the words regarding the Levites. Levites received no inheritance in the land. They only received an allotment, some place to stay where they could reside, practice their old covenant rites. The tribe of Levi, the priests, they received offerings through fire offerings, as it's called here, but this would have meant food, gifts to the Lord that God graciously used to provide for them. So did they get a bum deal? Was it better to get land? Well, is the land forever? Or is it passing away? Was it better to get land? Not if you were responsible for keeping it. We are better off to receive grace from God than we are to receive land. We must believe this because we live on land and it's being taken away. Right? Incrementally, beloved, the state is going to take it all away. Have we gotten a bum deal? The situation of the Levites in some ways foreshadows what all Christians have in the New Testament era according to the priesthood of all believers. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5-9. through 9. No Christian today, Jew or Gentile, receives a specific land inheritance from the Lord here on earth. However, we all have the promise of the eternal inheritance in the new heavens and the new earth, and it's better. It's a better covenant established on better promises. Don't forget that that's how God evaluates whether you get land or not. The covenant that promised land, if you were able to hold on to it, the covenant that doesn't promise land, but the new heavens and the new earth in Christ, that's a better covenant. The promises to receive that are better than the promises to receive land. God tells you there's a qualitative difference between me promising you a little strip of land in the Middle East and me promising you the new heavens and the new earth, which were bought by Christ, procured by Christ, are held by Christ, will be under the reign of Christ forever, and no enemy will be able to invade or take it back, ever. And your unfaithfulness will not forfeit the land, because the faithfulness of Christ stands before God for you and I. Adolf Harstad Harstad writes that all Christians are utterly dependent on the Lord. Their inheritance by grace is Him and His salvation. So when the Levites were told they would have no land, but that the Lord Himself would be their inheritance, they were actually getting the best allotment of all. That can't be lost. That isn't subject to decay or to our inabilities and our lack of strength and our unfaithfulness. When Lazarus and Martha's sister Mary chose to sit at the feet of Jesus and just listen to His Word, just be close to Him, what did Jesus say about her? She has chosen the better portion in Luke 10, 42. There is nothing better for a human to do than to sit at the feet of Jesus. And this is ours forever, literally, in Christ. Everyone who receives the better portion now is available to everyone who receives God's grace. Everyone. The Old Testament era, even the conquest of Canaan, was a real, living shadow and type of the true and everlasting inheritance of all God's people foreshadowed in the priests, the Levites. Here's what it would look like when you read Joshua and Judges and the rest of the Old Testament. Here's what it would look like if keeping the covenant and procuring the promise in our own strength, by our own works, here's what it would look like if that was the case. You'd lose it. You'd lose it. They lost it. We're no better than them. We're not above them. We're less religious than they were. We would have lost the land. If keeping the covenant is on us, we will lose everything and gain nothing. When Jesus comes and fulfills 
all the expectations and promises of the Old Testament. What he's doing is procuring for you everything God intends to give to his people. In Christ is what happens when all the work, all the procuring of the covenant, receiving all the promises, is dependent on God and therefore is secure and solid forever. Jesus has made us a kingdom of priests to our God and we shall reign with him forever. We will most assuredly receive the inheritance promised to us in Christ in the new heavens and the new earth and beloved moth and rust and enemies and sin and death and pain and suffering and struggle and trial and difficulty will not be able to touch it. They will not even be allowed there. This is God's word to you. Don't forget it in the mundane drag of everyday life. Trust when this God tells us what to do and how we ought to behave and what is best for us. We ought to listen. We ought to obey. We ought to do it. He is truth. He is rock solid. We do not need to fear. We do not need to pull back. Only trust Him. He's proven Himself worthy time and time again for you. He loves you. He needs to bring you all the way home to your inheritance.